I, I want to introduce Robert, uh, who has been one of the early supporters of the Soviet human rights movement back in the 1970s when he was a, just a very, very young man, but uh, so much more courageous than many people uh, that may have been older at the time. Uh, Robert was born in Montreal, but he is a citizen of uh, uh, Netherlands and also of Lithuania, where he lives, uh, has lived for quite a few years now. And uh, he uh, heads the, um, as the director, he heads the Andrei Sakharov Research Center for Democratic Development, which has been founded with my help, I'm happy to say, and with the approval of my brother, uh, as the inheritors of the uh, copyright to the name of Andrei Sakharov. Uh, this center has been founded in uh, 1917 at the Vitautas, Vitautas Magnus University in Kaunas, Lithuania. Uh, Robert is also a professor of Soviet and post-Soviet studies there. Uh, and more importantly, he is the chief executive of Human Rights in Mental Health. Federation Global Initiative of uh, on Psychiatry, which has been in existence for years and has done very, very important work in terms of protecting human rights of the, uh, of the sufferers of mental illness. And now he's engaged very actively in uh, mental health issues in Ukraine uh, and has been for many years now. Uh, he, as I mentioned, he became active in the Soviet human rights movement in the 1970s. Uh, he traveled to the, United, to the Soviet Union as a courier, delivering humanitarian aid and smuggling out information on the situation in the camps, prisons, and psychiatric hospitals. I'm sure there is a lot in common between Robert's work at the time with what uh, Laura is doing, Laura Thornton is doing now, or has been doing now what she has just told us about her work in Vietnam. Uh, and um, uh, the information that Robert was able to get out of the Soviet Union was uh, extremely useful in all the Western uh, and democratic campaigns for the release of Soviet dissidents. In 1980, Robert uh, co-founded uh, the International Association on Political Use of Psychiatry, and he became its general secretary in 1986. He was director of the Mikulski Foundation, Second World, War, Second World Center in Amsterdam, and he was a board member on many human rights and mental health organizations. His most recent publications are on dissidents and madness, which has came out in 2009. Also, Cold War in Psychiatry in 2010, in 2010, and Undigested Past, the Holocaust in Lithuania in 2011. He's currently professor of Soviet and post-Soviet studies in Kaunas, as I mentioned, and he also teaches in the Ilya State University in Tbilisi, Georgia. It's a special pleasure to introduce Robert. Thank you very much, Tanya. I thank you very much for the opportunity to formulate my thoughts on the subject of today's discussion. So to start with, I must confess that my mood and thoughts tend to change dependent on the news, which is coming from Ukraine. I've been working in that country for more than half of my life. The majority of my friends are from there, and many of them are now at the front defending their homes and families or are otherwise engaged in the struggle for survival. I share with them the pain when seeing the images that come to us constantly and when receiving news of people having lost their lives. It fulfills me with anger and distress combined with waves of hatred and disgust, but above all with the resolution and conviction that this war cannot be lost. Ukraine is fighting for our freedom and we do not have the liberty to look away. At moments like this, it's important to carefully select your words, and this is the reason why I put my remarks on paper. To me, the nature of the Putin regime has been clear from very early on. It's probably the result of a combination of factors. One of them is the fact that for eight years, I worked on projects within the Russian penitentiary system, 
with the main project being an effort to reform and reconstruct the psychiatric department of Kresti prison in St. Petersburg, which was then the largest pretrial prison in Europe. Coincidentally, at that time, the architect of many of the restrictive laws in Russia, the current head of the investigative committee of Russia, Alexander Bastrykin, was then minister of justice in Peter and Leningradsky Oblast, and I saw from very close by what kind of cold-blooded and corrupt character he was, who, by the way, had no problem accepting our cash euros as part of his so-called contribution to the project. I saw how our attempts to bring about attitudinal change were sabotaged by the main directorate of the prison system of the FCN in Moscow, then by the FSB, and eventually by the entourage around Putin. I saw how criminality and politics had merged and became one and the same. It was a steep learning curve, but a very handy one indeed. Secondly, I grew up in a family that was directly affected by the German occupation of the Netherlands. And from a very early age onwards, I was inundated with books about fascism, national socialism, and the Holocaust. The understanding of how a country is hijacked by a criminal gang is extremely helpful to understand Russia today. And there are indeed many, many similarities. By the way, both Hitler and Putin came to power democratically and then used the inability of democratically elected leaders to act decisively, to kill democracy altogether and establish totalitarian rule. There are people who still believe Russia is not a totalitarian state, but if you look at the characterization of totalitarianism by people like Hannah Arendt or Tsvetan Todorov, you will see that Putinist Russia is a, quite a classic example, almost by the book. This comparison with Nazi Germany is also helpful in a different way. It helps me understand the emotions of people who lived at that time, their paralysis and distress, their fear, and also my uncle's decision in 1940 to join the resistance when his beloved Rotterdam was bombed away, just like Mariupol, Lysychansk, Upasnia, and other Ukrainian cities and towns are raised to the ground by Russian forces today. I'm living in the Lithuanian capital Vilnius, which has become one of the main gathering places of the so-called Russian opposition. Already long before Putin invaded Russia, uh, Ukraine, Vilnius played this role, and annual meetings were organized in a resort outside the city where a large number of, oppos of oppositionists would gather to talk about the future. I was never invited, which was fine with me, as I tried to use my time as constructively as possible, but the feedback I always received was one that was similar to what my friend Victor Feinberg once told me, put four Russians in a car and you have five different opinions. These meetings have become more and more frequent, but as far as I can see, the outcome is still the same. Lots to do about nothing, no unified front, no moral leadership, and no ability to establish anything close to an alternative to Putin's criminal gang. They talk about developing a good Russian ID card that good Russians can show in restaurants and other places. But who in God's name is going to determine who is a good Russian? Does it include Russians who are now in opposition, but earlier enriched themselves at the expense of the Russian people? Does it include Russians who escaped when the war started and are lamenting on social media that their good lives have been destroyed and cry because their Instagram account have been blocked? These are really moments when I strongly feel the absence of Andrei Dmitrich, who was this moral leader and could have done so much to steer Russia away from this disaster if he had long lived longer just like Mandela in South Africa managed to avoid the worst possible outcome after the end of apartheid. In my view, Russia lost its chance in the beginning of the 1990s and everything that followed is in a sense, a logical consequence of this. We have lost the 30 years of de-Sovietization, which by the way, happened in Ukraine. And my fear is that when the moment is there, we will have to go all the way back to 1956 to Khrushchev's speech at the 20th Party Congress, and this time uncovering all the crimes of the Putin regime and starting again the process of de-Stalinization, however now combined with de-Putinization. In 1946, the German writer Thomas Mann wrote, how will it be to belong to a nation, to work in the spiritual tradition of a nation that never knew how to become a nation, under whose desperate megalomanic efforts to become a nation the world had to suffer so much. To be a German author, 
What will that be? Back of every sentence that we construct in our language stands a broken, a spiritually burnt out people, a people that can never show its face again. And here again, you see the similarity between Nazi Germany and Putin's Russia. But Nazi Germany was conquered. There was an outside force that made the Germans look in the mirror. And the shame that Thomas Mann felt was certainly not felt by the majority of his compatriots. And that feeling of shame is ab uh, fully absent among many Russians. I also don't see many opposition leaders who express that shame and who openly talk about the moral bankruptcy of the Russian nation and the collective responsibility for what is now transpiring in Ukraine. So what can the opposition do? I think there should be a two level approach, a public one and a silent one. The public one should be the establishment of a sort of, I don't know, United Front for the Liberation of Russia that unequivocally states that all occupied territories, including Ukraine, uh, Crimea, will be returned to the proper owner immediately and unconditionally. That all cronies of the Putin regime will be handed over to the criminal court, International Criminal Court in The Hague. That all stolen wealth will be returned to the Russian people. No compromises, no wooden wordings, no buts, only a clear and straightforward message to both Russia and the outside world. Yes, you will lose support of part of the Russians who oppose Putin, but I don't think here you can compromise. At least your movement or party will consist of really good Russians and you do not need to fake, uh, have a fake ID in order to do so. The silent approach should be a major effort to support Ukraine in its war for our freedom. Collect funds and provide them to neutral organizations that provide aid to the Ukrainian armed forces, and there are many of them. How many Bayraktars can the Russian opposition oligarchs finance? How many body armor, night goggles, drones, and other indispensable equipment can it purchase? This is a war that is fought on a totally different footing with every soldier on the ground having a so-called home front that supplies him or her with necessary additional equipment to defend the country. And it is this type of support that makes the Ukrainians so strong and resilient. The Russian opposition could contribute massively with their financial means. And don't expect gratitude on the Ukrainian part because it's only a moral obligation to help and to put your money to the common good cause. In conclusion, I believe that the only way Russia will have a chance to be free is when Ukraine wins this war. And it will then have to face the horrible moral dilemma that Thomas Mann so beautifully worded in 1946, and which brought the German Chancellor Willy Brandt in 1970 to Warsaw to kneel down in front of the monument for the Warsaw Uprising and ask for forgiveness. Thank you. <laughs>